Welcome everybody from Presenza and Imagine Action. Today we are here with Rana Salman and Esther Kurani from Combatants for Peace. Rana, Esther, thank you very much for joining us. So I uh, would like to immediately to pass to you and to let yourself in, introduce yourself and uh, and also to to tell about combatants for peace what is it what is it in your life especially in this you know difficult times um, current moment and how you get to combatants for peace who wants to to start um, so my name is Rana Salman and I am uh, from Bethlehem in the West Bank I actually was born in Jerusalem, but I have lived and grew up in Bethlehem all of my life. Um, I come from uh, a family that they are uh, refugees from the Nakba from 1948. Um, <clears throat> and um, I have been uh, with Competence for Peace for about uh, three years now. Um, I have joined during also a difficult time when uh, there was also the pandemic going on. And uh, I was looking for options like to continue my work in uh, nonviolence and um, uh, educational uh, programs. And I found this opportunity and uh, I found that Competence for Peace kind of reflect the future that I would like to see. And it's been um, an amazing journey and it's always inspiring every day that what we do it always inspires me to continue this journey because um, here we embody the future that we want to see. And that's uh, very important to see this joint community and how it keeps growing. And uh, we see that there is uh, that there is an option. We have the choice and it's, uh, it's possible and uh, it's doable. And uh, we actually, we do not only live together, we actually work together. We're trying to change the current reality and that's even more harder. But if we can do it, I think uh, the two societies can do it. It's uh, violence is not uh, the only choice as it has been uh, um, promoted for many years, as if we don't have any other choice. But here we found out that that's not uh, correct. We have a different choice and it's not a matter of fate. We actually take the decision to make uh, this change. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, so I'm actually originally from Hungary, so uh, it was not, and I didn't really plan on living in Israel. I, I am Jewish and uh, we have relatives here and uh, uh, I had connection uh, to Israel throughout um, also my childhood, but um, it happened quite not uh, planned that I ended up uh, staying here. Um, <coughs> and when I decided that, uh, that I'm, I'm staying in Israel, I wanted to look for a way that I can contribute to make this place um, equal for everyone or stop the conflict or however you want to call it. Um, because I think that even though I'm I'm Jewish and it was easy for me to immigrate to Israel, but it doesn't mean in any ways that uh, the Palestinians who were born and raised here for generations don't have the same right as I do. And uh, the, the official policy of Israel is, of course, different at the moment. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we have the conflict. So I decided that when if I'm staying here, I want to contribute to make this place peaceful and uh, and with equal rights to everyone living um, or choosing to live here. Um, and I found uh, through Suleiman Khatib, who is one of the founders of Competence for Peace, that I met him through a program. I found that uh, Competence for Peace is one of uh, the unique organizations that does this work. And uh, I joined first as uh, someone who is interested, I participated in programs and later on I got a, a job that was six and a half years ago um, and I'm still here and actually from the 1st of February 
I'm uh, the new incoming uh, Israeli CEO. So uh, I don't know when this is going to be published, but you can probably uh, change uh, or you can write incoming CEO or whatever, because uh, that's going to be uh, happening. So it's me and Rana coordinating this whole thing uh, from the 1st of February together. And, um, and the war, it didn't change my uh, relation to how I see the conflict or how I see Palestinians. Obviously, Hamas is a terrible organization and it's terrible what they did. And violence is not the way to reach anything. Um, I also see this as a mother, even like it, like even with the kids fight, if I go and shout at them, that's not going to be helpful. Um, and it essentially is the same thing, in my opinion. Um, so what, uh, and there are a lot of Israelis who like did believe kind of in peace. And then they say, ah, oh, there is no one to talk to because see what Hamas does. But we have other people who don't believe uh, in the force of violence, also among the Palestinians. And I think now it's even more important that we keep this uh, um, this unique formation of, uh, of Israelis and Palestinians working together towards peace with non-violent means. So it just uh, confirmed my choice um, and also the talks we have since then Sometimes they are hard because obviously we, we are in a very, very difficult situation, but it, we always have the willingness to make it work and to talk openly about differences or how we see the world, but it's, it's part of the story. Like we need to, we need to be honest with each other and, uh, and talk through and walk through also the difficult times. Uh, I want to go a bit deeper in what is the, the work of Combatants for Peace. And um, Rana, you said this, embody the future. I want to, to know more about this expression, embody the future. And also you said a lot about possibilities. It's possible um, another way it's possible. Violence is not the only option. So what, what does Combatants for Peace um, uh, do uh, really and uh, uh, what are the activities the, the methodologies yeah I just want to share a little bit about uh, the background of uh, Compatence for Peace so when it was founded it was uh, back in 2006 we were also ex uh, experiencing also a difficult time it was after the second intifada there was so much uh, violence happening and the movement actually started from ex-combatants, uh, Israelis who were serving in the Israeli army and they refused to continue, and uh, Palestinian freedom fighters who spent time resisting in uh, violent means. And uh, they both realized that uh, this uh, we're trapped in this cycle of violence uh, and it doesn't lead us anywhere. So they decided to lay down their uh, weapons and join their forces and uh, co-resist together all oppressive systems and all violence in any shape and form in, uh, in the whole region. And that's how the movement actually started and uh, it's growing. Um, currently, uh, it's, uh, the movement is open uh, to everyone. They don't have to be ex combatants They don't have to be involved in any violent actions previously. It's more uh, inclusive. Uh, we have also so many women joining, so many young uh, participants. And uh, as long as they all believe in the values of the movement and the values of uh, uh, justice and uh, nonviolence and equality and uh, living together in dignity. Um, so that's, uh, that's how we reach to this uh, place right now. And what we have been doing is also trying to target um, a new generation of uh, activists through our educational programs, uh, through our protests. Uh, there is a huge like movement of refuseniks at the moment, people who have been uh, in uh, tours in the West Bank and in Area C, they have, been how, they have seen how the occupation is affecting the lives of uh, Palestinians and Israelis, and it's not offering any 
people the security that uh, they are seeking. And that's why they refuse to continue serving in this um, uh, military system, because we know that there is no military solution for this uh, conflict and they come to this realization. There are other ways. That's why we also work with uh, young people, trying to educate them about the conflict, hearing their personal stories of each other, trying to create this kind of dialogue. Because in, uh, there are no other uh, places where uh, they actually can meet each other. For me personally, uh, it took me so many years until I met uh, an Israeli and it wasn't actually in this region. So we're trying to create these opportunities because, because of all of these um, separation, uh, whether with the facts on the ground, the separation wall, checkpoints, uh, the permit system, um, it creates, uh, it makes it uh, difficult for people to actually know each other. What they know is what they see on two different media channels, the stereotypes about each other. Uh, we try to break that and get people closer, not only in dialogue, but also to uh, do action together to change the reality for both people so that we can uh, live together in uh, uh, in more justice world and more sustainability and more dignity for both people. Thank you. And I want to go back to this, meeting the other, meeting the so-called enemy. And uh, both of you, um, it was interesting for me to, to read about uh, your biography and to know that both of you, you met uh, not in, uh, in Israel, but you, you, you met the other outside, abroad, in your uh, experiences of traveling, uh, moving. So um, I wonder how it is possible uh, to meet the other or what are the obstacles to meet the other uh, to meet really to meet uh, I mean meet the other with uh, his her story maybe Esther you want to go first this time okay. yeah so um, this is indeed as Rana said this is one of our core or maybe the core uh, of our activities and um, as you said, like being out of your normal life context, I think mm -hmm. it makes this meeting easier. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, my story is a little bit different because the first time I met uh, the, like th that I really met the Palestinian narrative, it was indeed in uh, Napoli, uh, mm -hmm. where I did uh, one year of uh, exchange with the Erasmus program and, uh, and my, my flatmate was very much involved in, in everything what's going on in, with the conflict and with Palestinians and uh, through her studies. And also, I think this narrative is much more present in Italy than in Hungary, at least uh, even now. Yeah, it's, in Hungary, it's not something that you can really hear. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it was very surprising for me and it was somehow part of this whole multicultural experience that I anyway had. So probably I was more open uh, to receive a different perspective than what I knew from, uh, from my home and, and from our relatives living in Israel. Uh, and it was still hard, like it, it still took me years until I could really, really uh, see the whole picture. Hmm. Um, what was the, the, the hardest thing to receive? What was the difference, um, the fundamental difference in the two narratives? The one that you received from your family and the one that you uh, encountered in Napoli um, with your um friend um i think because like also all of my grandparents are holocaust survivors so even though they choose to stay in hungary or actually go back to hungary uh two of them after having been in a concentration camp um they they choose to be there but still israel was always something that they said that okay we don't live there but this is like it's very very good that we have israel as a safe space that 
mm-hmm. that protects the Jewish people. And if it ever happens again, we now have a place to go. So that was always the narrative. And also when I was a little bit older and, and uh, I heard about the separation, well, for instance, um, because I, I was already like at the, towards the end of high school and I was even thinking to go to volunteer in a, in a kibbutz, in a community in Israel when I finished high school. And my parents told me no, because it was at the time when the, when the second intifada was going on. So I knew something is not okay already. On the other hand, the narrative was always like, yeah, so we, there was the little Israel and then in 67 there was a war and as a consequence of the war, uh, Israel occupied more territories, but it's really like occupying the territories, but not occupying the people and it was necessary. So the Syrians will not uh, kill uh, people living uh, next to, next to the Golan Heights. So it was always coming with an explanation why it's necessary and it was never up about the people, the Palestinian people. Like they said, oh, they are okay. Like maybe it's not the best, but, but you know. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know the details of how occupation looks like. Yes. Um, and when my friends started to say, oh, it's occupation, it's occupying people. It's not only making the land bigger so the Jewish people in Israel are secure. So that was like, oh, okay, well, wait a minute. Mm. (laughs) Because it's really, really different. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Rana, how it was for you to meet an Israeli? Um, Well, the first time I met an Israeli, I was uh, very young and I was joining an educational program out in uh, Germany. So we were... uh, participants coming from uh, different uh, countries. And uh, I think my first experience wasn't so good because we always want to uh, make sure you stick to your narrative. You're uh, very young, very kind of revolutionary. You want to, uh, you know, that this is the right and you're not so open like to hear the other, let's say. Yes. But uh, growing... Uh, Growing older, I also wanted to, it's a, it's kind of like a personal effort. There are not so many programs that actually bring us together. So it's mm-hmm. something that you seek to learn, something that you look for. And uh, that's how when I was a little bit older, I joined uh, a program for women, actually. And it was uh, with the Outward Bound for Peace Building and Search for Common Ground. And we were a group of uh, Palestinian and Israeli women. We went into uh, an experience uh, in the wilderness, a hiking uh, uh, trail for 10 days. And uh, when I first joined, I, uh, I thought it was kind of uh, like the survival TV show. Like it's a competition and one of us has to win. It's always have been like us versus them. It's uh, uh, in the mindset. And um, being in the program and realizing that there was... Uh, no trophy that we were actually fighting for. There was no prize that we want to win. It was, uh, we were actually partners in this learning journey. Yes. And that's how um, my conception has uh, changed and uh, learned that uh, we can walk together in a, like a difficult uh, uh, circumstances and help each other and hear each other. We have spent so much time together. Uh, I could walk blindfolded with an Israeli leading the way. It was about more building the trust with the other. And I've never had this kind of experience uh, here before. So that also like opened the door for me to learn more and look for other opportunities to, to hear different perspectives. And uh, uh, this actually made me more open and created friendships actually with the other, uh, which I wasn't uh, expecting that I would come up with, uh, from the program with this um, uh, this change and uh, here I am like now at Competence for Peace which is also a joint community of Palestinians and Israelis and we're actually working together and it's a totally different experience but uh, the things that we have experienced throughout the years I feel like it has led us led us to to this point that uh, uh, you have to open your heart and your mind and uh, um, hear the different narratives, the different experiences with respect and uh, acknowledgement of the past and to work for a different future, not only for our generation, but also for the next generation. Yeah, thank you. 
and uh, yeah, you uh, spoke about women, a program for women, and before Esther was also referring uh, to to be a mother. And uh, I wonder if you had in your experience some reflections or insights um, about being women, maybe mothers, um, and being in a land that it's uh, in this uh, cycle of violence and then being involved in a violent moment? I, I experience um, both like somehow something with the Middle East. Uh, there is something very masculine energy, like just in general, um, in, in, in the life of, uh, of Middle East. And it's not even also only Israel, like I had the same experience in Turkey. Um, Maybe because I'm coming from, you know, uh, a different a different culture in Hungary. Uh, so that's one thing. Also because Comedians for Peace was founded mostly by male people because they they are the ones who, who take usually part or bigger part in in really being in the front of, of the violent conflict. Also, Combatants for Peace in itself has a quite uh, masculine energy uh, in general. On the other hand, uh, in the last years, we are really, really working to change this. So it's also a willingness even from the men who, who are the founders and like the founding fathers, like they somehow understood that uh, they have to involve um, the voice of women in the work. And also us, like working in the organization or being, uh, being activists, it's, uh, it's something that, that is very present. And I think also for the younger generations, it's becoming more and more obvious that you have to have women on board. Otherwise, uh, it's really just not going to be a whole like it's not going to be uh, something that uh, really represents people um so being all this uh, th having said all this uh, it's still sometimes difficult like when we meet even on, on zoom or face to face there is a tendency that men will speak before women and more like more men will speak than women but we are also really like just doing simple facilitation te techniques so that we don't fall into this uh, trap because sometimes it's even unconscious like sometimes i myself like i'm Ah, he, he wanted to say something, so I rather let him speak and then I will say my thing afterwards, even if I raised my hand before. So, you know, it's like very much, I think it's deep inside us um, as, as women um, for centuries or thousands of years. So to, to change this culture is very, very dif difficult, but uh, we are working on it and... Um, and I see also a change in the man, like even in the last six years that I'm involved with CFP, I see that there is more openness and acceptance and uh, okay, we still have to sometimes uh, fight for our, our voice, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's getting somewhere. And, and I really, really believe that the experience of being, being a woman in general, um, it holds something that can be less violent in its in its nature and uh, to bring this forward will really support uh stopping violence in general and as rana said that we are embodying something that we wish for the future so the work we are doing here it uh, can have like a dissemination effect and it can go uh, also in other parts of society thank you rana what about you and being woman in the West Bank and and then in combatants for peace? Yeah. So yeah, as Esther mentioned, when I actually first joined uh, the movement, it was more uh, male uh, dominant because of the field as itself and uh, how it was founded by ex combatants mostly men. Uh, sometimes in the beginning, I was probably the only woman in the room. 
But uh, I came to the realization, even if I was the only one, even if I was a minority in my own society, um, even if uh, there was no uh, equality in the gender, if I am there, then I should uh, raise my voice and uh, share and be uh, like uh, be a participant. And uh, I think uh, over the years, uh, the situation even like within the organization itself has been changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the movement has been for 20 years uh, uh, going on. And now you can see that there are two female uh, leaders for the movement, yes. which uh, never happened before. So I believe that we are changing actually the concept. We're giving more space for women to be leaders, to raise their voices. We have so many programs that are actually led by women inside the movement. And uh, that's what's really special about here is that we're becoming more and more inclusive and giving the space for everyone to, to participate. And it's, uh, it's not that usually in a conflict, women are uh, more vulnerable. Um, women are mostly affected by the war and the conflict. We have seen also in Gaza, uh, women are the ones who are... Uh, uh, being affected by the war a lot. Uh, so many women and children were killed. Um, there are so many uh, women who are like pregnant during this time and had lost their, uh, their babies because of the situation and fear and starvation and uh, weather conditions. Um, we saw some images of women writing their children's names on their hands just in case they got lost or got killed so that they can be identified. So I believe it's... Uh, this war and this ongoing violence and the conflict, it, uh, it has more effect on the women also psychologically and uh, uh, mentally and uh, physically. So, and as, my, as Esther mentioned, like in nature, women are more, less violent. They call more for uh, reconciliation because we are mothers, we are daughters, we are sisters. We care more about, um, about uh, our families and our, the peace that is within, uh, uh, whether it was from the family to our uh, societies and our organization, we try to contain everybody's feelings of anger and fear and uh, hopelessness. So we have a big responsibility. And it's now more obvious that women can handle things in a different way. And uh, even in research, it shows that when women are involved in uh, peace processes, the peace is more uh, sustainable and it, it lasts for a longer time. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I have this challenging question. You know, I had an interview uh, some months ago with uh, Suleiman Khatib and Henalon, uh, two men. Uh, and then also I asked them to uh, have the chance to meet two women. And um, I had a, a challenging question for them. I asked to Han to imagine to talk with the Gazawi child. And, um, and, and I asked to Suleiman to talk, to imagine to talk with a child, an Israeli child affected by the massacre of the 7th October. And um, I have also a challenging question for you. This time, I wonder if you can imagine Rana to talk with a Palestinian, but a Palestinian that is um, in fear, in rage, and, um, and can't see possibilities, can't see uh, other choice than violence. And also, I invite Esther to imagine to talk with an Israeli, but um, also uh, an Israeli that is uh, caught in this uh, cycle of violence. And also, I want to refer to what you mentioned before, a safe place, as in the narrative that you had in your family. So to, to have this... Uh, um, trust in a safe place where Jewish people can be secure um, because there is this sentence if it happens again, right? So this trauma of the Holocaust. Um, so I, I ask you to uh, take also a moment of silence and to really imagine this dialogue and to 
to be in the dimension of the heart, not just in the mind, but uh, really to acknowledge this fear, this rage, and starting from, from this. I actually had this conversation. Okay. So I read your uh, this question in the morning. Uh, I, I already made uh, some thinking, but uh, but it actually is a conversation that happened. Um, I'm studying to be a tour guide, and, and uh, most of the people there are very very right wing because you know it's like coming to show the beauties of Israel to tourists and all this. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of those people. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the men I study with, he's like around 50, I think, maybe a little bit less, so a couple of years uh, older than me. Um, and he's this very machoistic, uh, religious, uh, has, I don't know, six kids and uh, works in one of the office, uh, one of the government agencies in a high rank. Uh, I don't know why he wants to become a tour guide, but okay. Um, and uh, like born and raised in Jerusalem and uh, going to do reserve duty even when there is no war, even though he doesn't have to be like above the age of 40, man doesn't, doesn't have to go to do reserve duty, but he volunteered to continue. Um, and when the war uh, broke out, so he immediately went and was also in Gaza and in the north and um, and we met like in the beginning of the Jan of January for the first time after the 7th of October. And he, he knows that we don't agree politically. Like uh, I, I told everyone where I work because I didn't want to hide it uh, from people that sometimes I do actually, but uh, not from people that I have a one year long course together and we are like uh, super intensively uh, spent time together. I made the choice that I that I don't that I want to tell them what I do in my life. Uh, so actually, he came to me and said, "Like, okay, now what do you think?" Like, and he was expecting me to say that, um, "Yeah, I'm with you. Like, mm -hmm. we have to go and 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 uh, put Gaza as a flat land without people, and only that will." Um, that will have uh, guarantee us security. So we started to talk, and this was the first time actually that he was willing to listen. Like usually our talks are not really talks. It's just like he's giving a speech, and then I want I start to speak, and then he walks away. Mm -hmm. uh, and this time he was really like with me. He was really listening, mm -hmm. and I told him no. Like I believe that there are a lot of Palestinians who don't want violence and uh, that on one hand, obviously, uh, we have to make sure that we live in security, but on the other hand, the security will come from trust and from creating spaces that are uh, secure for both. Mm -hmm. um, it can be two, two separate states. Maybe it can be an, also another solution. Uh, but we need to we need to think out of the box and and breaking the cycle of violence because violence will bring more violence. And we the conversation went on a little bit, and then we we stopped. Uh, I also sent him uh, one of uh, the talks we had. Uh, on Gaza and on the history of Gaza. Um, I sent him the recording by WhatsApp. Uh, and then we met the week after. And he said, I saw that you sent something. I didn't have the time to open. And then he was like, you know what? I think we agree in 99% of, of uh, what we think. The only difference, the only big difference that I see is that you are optimistic and I'm pessimistic. And I wish I had your optimism to believe that it can also work without using violence. Hmm. So that was, a, it was a, like, I'm, you know, still it's probably, it doesn't mean that he will not go back, back to the army when he's called to, or he will say something as to his children. But I think that like, I managed to plant a little seed of 
okay, there, there, there is another way. There should be another way. So, yeah, that's my uh, story <laughs> for now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Okay, for, uh, for me, I think we have these kind of conversations all the time. And now, especially with the war going on, it's even more. This is all we talk about. And I, I personally believe that it's very difficult to change somebody's mind because this is like a personal journey that they need to go through. Um, and if they don't, it's very difficult to, for them to recognize that uh, there are other options. Um, I think uh, when we talk about it, it's just like bringing up some examples like from uh, previous experiences in the Palestinian struggle. For example, the Second Intifada, there was so much violence, so much armed struggle, and uh, nothing was actually accomplished at all. So, like, asking the questions, like, if we keep going on and on, like, with armed resistance, like, uh, what, what, uh, what is the result that we are expecting to, to achieve? Uh, I like the quote that uh, says, of Mahatma Gandhi, that says, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And we are actually trapped in this cycle of violence. Like uh, um, they fire at us, we fire back. Uh, they hit us, we hit back. And and what's uh, what's the result at the end? Like where do we want to reach? That's uh, that's the question. And uh, comparing it to like previous experiences, like in the first Intifada, it was uh, a non-violent struggle of the Palestinian people with many protests uh, and demonstrations. And it took us to into a peace process. Uh, uh, agreement like it was Oslo uh, but at least there was something that came up out of it because of uh, we, we reached to a negotiations uh, system so I feel like uh, people can see now the difference and um, not everybody was expecting actually the war to take that long like uh, mm -hmm. because Gaza has experienced wars like every two three years there is a war on Gaza but this is the first time that it takes so long and there's a humanitarian ex uh, crisis right now and uh, displacement and uh, many killings also from the Israeli side because uh, this is the first time that we experienced something uh, like uh, so tragic like this in this uh, region and uh, that also was the wake-up call for uh, for many people like uh, to see that no this is the time we need to actually get into an agreement because for a long time we have been just managing this conflict we're trying to make life a little bit easier for people to continue to be silent, but eventually it just broke out. That's why in this, why we are in this moment right now. Uh, that's why we need a political uh, solution that actually achieves the needs of the people, the Israelis and the Palestinians, to live in peace and dignity, with freedom, with their uh, equal rights, with the, uh, everything that... Um, more sense of uh, sustainability that is uh, built on a good foundation. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's it. Yeah, thank you. So we have just the um, last minutes for our conversation. And uh, I, I have in mind this quote, there is no peace, peace is the way. Um, so how this resonate with you and um, also, you you talked a lot about uh, a shift in the mindset, um, a process of opening mind and heart. So, how how is it possible? How is it possible to make room in the heart for hope, for what uh, the man that you uh, spoke with, Esther? Um, called op optimism, but maybe for me uh, it's hope, uh, an, an active hope, because it's not just a wish, but uh, it's a hope and uh, that it's um, mm, something that it's uh, in the action, right? So uh, how peace is the way, um, really, and um, how we can, can feel it even in this humanitarian disaster, massacre, violence, anger, uh, sense of injustice, sense of uh, being unsafe, you know. Um, and even 
uh, I think we are not short of hope, of wisdom, of courage. Maybe we are short in accessing them. Um, so, yeah, how all this resonates uh, in you, how it's possible even now. I think, like, for me, our joint work, it gives a lot of hope um, that if we are able to do this, then, you know, anyone can. Like, after all, we are just normal people that decide to trust each other and decide to make things work even when it's hard. Um, and, yeah, like, if we turn the question around, like, if I'm had the chance to meet now a child from Gaza that went through enormous suffering, maybe lost her parents. I don't know. I don't, I, I really don't know what I would tell her where to find hope, but we are in a privileged place. Like, uh, after all our life, even if it's very much affected also on, on day to day life and Rana's is much more than mine. Uh, but still, you know, like like uh, we live very close to a war and in a conflict uh, area, even if we are not directly um, directly affected by it. But I think it somehow we just like we we have this uh, some moral call to to trust so that we can do things to make to to. To do a change, and um, uh, and I also strongly believe that also the, the little things that one does, like even in in personal uh, life, it it has an effect. Like uh, a lot of times, people say that okay, only when the powers will decide, or only then then I will also be there to to join uh, to join something that gives hope and. My philosophy is just different. Like I believe that even when I do little things, it it ends up uh, to adds adds up to the big picture, and uh, and it will make a change. And and I see this like we just had a, a seminar for Israeli activists, and there was a woman who said, "Wow, I now shared my feelings and thoughts on the war." and on, on how I feel that I couldn't tell not to my uh, closest friends and not to my family. Wow. And you know, like, it's, and allowing her to express herself, it makes her a more relieved person who can then have more energy to act and do uh, things that she believes in. And if we are there to have this uh, opportunity for her, that's already something. So I believe that these little things that we have the power to do, and especially when we do it by nationally, it 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 just ma it it makes something. So that's what gives me hope, and also the ability to recognize them, like to have this story, for example, with the man I talk with or this woman who shared in the seminar, and to bring it with me so that I, you know, like I I treasure these little uh, sentences. So to show myself that, okay, it, 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 it makes sense. It's not only a, a dream. Well, uh, thank you for sharing the quote. It's, um, it's a great one. Um, I think uh, currently, like uh, what's going on, people stop talking a lot about peace and more like towards uh, justice and uh, collective liberation. Um, People feel this is what uh, what is needed right now, and to be liberated from uh, the pain and the violence and the generational trauma that we have been both societies uh, experiencing for so many years, and we definitely need peace. Uh, and uh, we believe that the way to to get there is uh, through nonviolence, and that's our uh, uh, principle actually in the movement. It's our uh, DNA. And that's what we try also to teach uh, to teach others, and to to join their uh, to join our actions in this uh, way. Um, yeah, I think yeah maybe the journey is too long, uh, but I think uh, out of every crisis there's an opportunity, and currently we have this opportunity to change uh, the current situation and to work together 
to end this uh, bloodshed, this violence, and to find a way for uh, reconciliation and uh, building trust again and uh, uh, reaching to uh, a peaceful solution, a political solution that will, uh, will not be imposed by any uh, outer uh, power, but more that uh, the both sides will agree on and uh, uh, go through with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and sharing your experiences, thoughts, um, hopes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much as well.